find the fastest way out, steal yourself, fight your way out. You pick your best stat or the stat that most appropriately fits. Strong hit, you get out with momentum. Weak hit, you get out, but you pay a cost. And on a miss, you can't leave yet. You have to deal with the danger, then you may make your escape. So I wonder, on a miss, if you overcome it, ah, then you, ah, okay. So in this way, if you miss, you still, you still escape. I like that escape the depths is triggered after you've decided to flee. And it's not about whether or not you do flee. It's about what fleeing looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no matter what, you escape. The move comes after you have decided to escape. It's not about do I get out. And that's that's a nuanced, uh, nuanced difference, right? So you don't make this move, then fail, then have to make the move again because you're out, right? But if you haven't resolved it, because remember, oh, and this is, wow, this is just such a, just fucking tasty mouthful of game design. So check this. So let's compare these two pieces of design and talk about why they matter, right? Okay, so read the, read the phrasing on this. If you are returning to a previously explored site, roll both challenge dice, take the lowest value, clear that number of boxes. So note, you do this if you are returning. So let's catch back up. Let's go back to where we were, right? When you choose to flee, you flee, no matter what, unless you die trying, right? If you never go back to the dungeon, you never make that progress move, and it's done. You've left. But if you come back, that's when you reroll the dice, and you may well be discovering it for the first time again. You're, you're rediscovering it. That's really cool. So you don't, you don't check on your progress. It's, it's Schrodinger's dungeon. You don't check on your progress until you go back for a second or third or fourth time. And I love the idea of returning and then mixing those things up, right? Say you return, but it's not, it's not using the same, the same oracles anymore. When we visited the first time, it was a uh, fortified uh, stronghold. But now we've come back a year later and it is a haunted ruin. Same place, different stuff, right? The dungeon itself can change. Oh, that's, that's so cool. It's really, really cool. So you can only make this move when you're in a position to escape, that escaping isn't the sole quest, right? And then finally, if you'd rather detail your journey back out, then then do it differently, right? Yeah, you can you can take a longer escape. So you could have like, I would also not use this move if the way out is drastically different than the way in, right? If you came in through a dwarven road, but you have to escape through a bunch of narrow tunnels, I would use a different, I wouldn't use the escape move, right? Because it's thematically like almost like a different site. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So the delve moves aren't the only actions you take in a site. Make other iron sworn moves as appropriate to the circumstances and your intent. Take proactive action when circumstances give you an opportunity. Make reactive moves when a situation forces you to avoid a threat or endure a hardship. Just play the game like normal inside a site. Yeah. Fictional framing dictates the moves you can make. Excuse me. I need a moment alone with this diagram. Can I just, if everybody could just, just look away. Just look away for a moment. 
<laughs> this is so good. This is the kind of thing, like this exact page is the kind of page that I wish desperately we had put in Dungeon World. Uh, it's it's the kind of like, I love, I love this shit, right? If you've watched me do GM prep, this is how I prep places, right? This is a map. So this is how you play the game. This is This is it. This is the whole move structure of this supplement. It's perfect. This is exactly what I want. So there you go. So this is our summary of terms. This is a sick picture of a boat. It's funny, just looking at these images, I've been shooting a lot of black and white lately. Just looking at these images, I'm like, I could replicate that. I could make that work. Here, you want to see the whole picture? Yeah, baby. It's a slightly cool tinted monochrome image with high clarity and high contrast. I could totally, I could do this. <laughs> All right, let's continue taking a taking a look. So here's how we tune our experience, options and techniques to customize the delve mechanics, right? So managing sites and quests. Typically, site is an obstacle to be overcome in a related quest, right? You swear to rescue somebody from a stronghold. You swear to reclaim an object from a barrow. You swear to kill a dragon within a cave, right? Those are those are things that those are things that you can do. Um, in each of those examples, the delve and the uh, quest itself are both basically the same. Now, if the quest is related to a site, go to the place, do the thing. It's appropriately low rank. You just go and do it, right? If your quest is keyed to a particular site, consider how to introduce opportunities for complexity and milestones, right? Milestones: getting to the place, finding the place itself. Uh, additional complexity within the place. So let's talk about Keep on the Borderlands, right? So in Keep on the Borderlands, you go to the Caves of Chaos because you want to fuck things up. You want to go get treasure. Player characters accumulate quests from specific NPCs that can be resolved inside the, uh, the Caves of Chaos, but there's no main quest. The quest is not to clear out the caves. The quest is make peace with the Goblin Tribe, kill off all the kobolds, rescue a certain character. You could pick up three or four different vows that all take place within a single delve. The delve itself might be epic level, and theoretically you could kill the ogre, the cultists, the owl bear, the demon, the like everything in the dungeon, but that would take a whole campaign to do. But while you're doing it, you are pacing out smaller quests within an objective and now I swear to God, I just want to run, keep on the borderlands, but using Iron Sworn. It really wouldn't be that difficult. It would be much more constrained than Iron Sworn normally is, but it would be the larger quest, right? The, the delve itself, various subquests you can get, NPCs you can interact with, and then locations within the dungeon that are tied to those specific, you could do it pretty easily. It would be like a hand wavy or dungeon worldy version of that. But yeah, like old school adventures, the next generation. Yeah. Right. Pretty cool. Right. Okay. What? What the, what the fuck is that? What is that thing? Risk zones. Oh, they're dungeon levels. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. So you could set it. So the first three are low risk areas. The middle four are medium risk areas and the top three are formidable. Risk. So you're going down levels of the dungeon or you're getting closer and closer to the, the danger, right? You know what you could use delve for? Oh my God. Oh, I want this so bad now. Iron sworn stalker. 
uh, a roadside picnic. They're zones. The closer you get to the center of the zone, to the alien radiation, the weirder and more dangerous things get. This is this is this is a, a way to do fucking Jeff Vandermeer uh, Southern Reach type shit. This is annihilation, right? Yeah. They're literally zones in that case. Oh, wow. That's so cool. And then the zone has within it its own themes and and structures, but then also random shifts. And, uh, oh, man, and the idea is the farther out of the zone you are, the, I mean, you could do this in a fantasy setting, right? Like a magical artifact, uh, a demon incursion, whatever. The closer you get to the center, the more dangerous it becomes. Oh, that's really cool. And then if you really wanted to, you could break these down, and I'm sure the game will just do this too. You could break these down into separate oracles. So the first three ranks are surface level ruins, right? Surface ruins. The next ranks are ancient dungeon. The last ranks are underdark. So you could you could break this down so that the theme of the dungeon changes the deeper you go. Yeah, 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 cool. So you set this, if you, so the way that risk zones interact with setting the rank is that the rank really indicates progress. It's how long it takes to get through each zone. So if a dungeon is epic, it's going to take 12 low risk ticks before you even get into the medium risk area. And if you try to bail out on your quest early, there is a chance you could find the sword of Dathron on level two, but probably not, right? Because you have a way lower chance of succeeding at your quest. Damn. That's really neat. That's really, really neat. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Failure. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Failure. Speaking of Nabake. Failure is a key part of your journey. If you'd like to make failure a more influential aspect of your character's evolution while taking a, the sting out of rolling a miss, use the... Did you write these for me? Is this a subtweet? I feel like... I feel a little bit called out right now. If your character is a train wreck moron who never uses the right stat for anything and just pisses off everyone around them... Maybe you want to use Adam can't roll to save his life rules. Sorry, learning from failure. When creating your character or introducing this option, create a failure track. This is a standard progress track. When you make an action and score a miss, you mark your failure. When your failure track is at plus six or greater, you may learn from your failures. This is a progress move to resolve the impact of these misses on your character. What? That's so cool. When you spend time reflecting on your hardships and missteps, roll your challenge dice and compare your progress. On a strong hit, you commit to making a dramatic change. Take three experience and clear all progress. Discard a single asset and take two experience. Mark an oath and reroll any dice. Ready your next steps. On a weak hit, you learn from your mistakes. On a miss, you've learned the wrong lessons. The problem is Nabake never spends time reflecting on her missteps. I guess reflecting on her hardship, like, oh, everything sucks. I, I think we need to I think we need to use these rules. I think we do need to in, uh, put them into the game. Also because they're really cool. I like that. And it allows you to change things by shedding previous. So like, for example, I could learn that my being a mercenary is actually just holding Nabake back and we could give up the Soldier of Fortune advance, get some experience, and then buy something new. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Or if we just keep failing, we just take an experience point, set off on an ill-fated path. That's what I want. 
I want to mark my failure, then I want to fail to learn anything from it, and then just keep failing and failing to learn and failing and failing to learn. This is the only way I want Nabake to ever get experience until finally she gets her shit together. <laughs> so how much is it to get the whole Iron Sworn PDF series? I think it's like 15 bucks for like everything because the core game is free. And then this supplement is, I think, like $14.95 for the PDF or something. Yeah, way too cheap, Sean. But I, I see I see your business model, and I hope you sell a million copies of Delve to make up for how inexpensive you've made Iron Sworn. Um, I also saw some photos of the physical version of the game. It's pretty hot. I feel like that's where you wanna that's where you wanna go, right? Yeah. So get the PDF, and if you love it. Definitely buy the buy the physical copy. Uh, but yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it's an approach. It works, right? Got me to play it. Got a lot of people to try it for the first time. Uh, cool. All right. Maps. The kind of maps I can draw. So whether you're a player or a GM, a map can supplement your usual method of record keeping. All right. So... Uh, let me make a, let me make a note. So we gotta, actually, I guess I can just do it in game. Um, so I'm going to, uh, add in the failure rules. We're going to take on our first delve. I'm going to use draw.io to set up, uh, a, a, a flow chart for this. Right. And then we're going to map the, we're going to map the dungeon as we go through it. Oh my God. I'm so excited to play. Ah, it's going to be rad. Okay, cool. And then, yeah, relationship maps so you can relate objects. And, and I mean, I, I do this shit all the time, right? This is already how I prep every game. So this is, this is perfect. I'm into it. Yeah. Cool. I love it. Using relationship maps outside of a site, using them in your game. Good. Do this. This is an incredibly helpful way to manage anything in a role-playing game. So definitely, yeah, definitely feeling it as these uh these roles in the game cool okay all right so this is a lot of stuff we're already kind of doing um i guess i guess technically we could do a relationship map for the game as part of our start of the session okay so maybe i will maybe i will make some notes so delve so i'm going to remember to one use the failure rules okay two we're going to make an r map of everybody who hates me. And then three, uh, we will delve some shit. Okay, cool. Yeah, neat. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's that. Um, because delve is focused on generating your surroundings and resolving your movement with a higher level of granularity, it might involve a lot of dice rolling. If you don't want to do that, you can just go with your gut on the Oracle, which is what we usually do, right? Uh, you can let it ride big ups to the burning wheel. So you roll a 67 and you keep it and then you can flip it. Right. So you do the, the rain, make a single roll, do more for you. Oh, you can cast runes. You pre-roll the Oracle dice and then you just take them off. Okay. So I have a, um, I'm going on a little like gaming weekend thing in, in uh, Washington with some friends. And my original plan was just to run Dune, like the, the uh, board game to play Dune as many times as possible. But now I'm going to have to go to drive through RPG. I'm going to have to buy a physical copy of all of this stuff. And I'm going to have to take it with me. And I'm going to have to run this game for all my friends so they can play it because it's so fucking good. Thanks a lot, Sean, for throwing a monkey wrench in my plans. Whatever am I going to do? And this is awesome. Casting runes. So you just take a bunch of D10s, you throw them on the table, and you say, these are the runes. Now, if the first thing you thought of was, can we do this with things that are not D10s? Hell yes. Hell yes, you can. Do you have actual runes? Use those assign runes to the table and then throw them on the table and draw them and be like, okay, well we got a, uh, a, 
I don't know the Futhark runes, but like we got an Omega and we got a Gamma. And that means these are the results. If you want to really get skeuomorphic about it. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, queue up a list of D100 results in your favorite uh, your favorite thing. You could also, if you're using a digital dice roller, you could also use the 3D dice and take a screenshot and then cross them out on the screenshot. I think in roll 20, you can also, I think you can drag results. Let me let me do a quick look here. Cause I think you can, I think you can drag results onto the table in roll 20. And I want to do this just so I can see what it what it looks like. Let's see here. Where are you, Iron Sworn? Yeah, right? Exactly. So, hold on. My roll 20 is just coming uh, coming up here. Okay. So, yeah, you could you could theoretically if you wanted to do it, you could do like I think I have 3D dice turned on. Uh 10 10d10. So, you could do this and you could just snap that screenshot so you'd have a five and then a 50 and then you've got a three or a 32, right? But you can also, you could also, I think, how do we, oh, you can only drag individual results to the, to the table, right? That's, that's the only thing that's the object. Okay. Yeah. So you could screenshot that and then put it on the, uh, on the table that way. Interesting. Cool. All right. Yeah. And then for folks who are asking about card decks, yeah, you could, you could put them in as a deck, right? Or as a uh, rollable table right? in the system here. Neat. Cool. All right, let's keep looking. So, interested in customizing how sites work? This is how that goes. You can play without themes and domains, which is basically just like winging it on a broader scale. Um, you can use multiple domains or themes, right? So odd and even results. So this is how you get the fortified infested mine. I like those a lot. That's quite cool. Do the same thing with domains. And then creating your own themes and domains. Yeah. So these are your blank templates for creating your own. And they come pre-filled with what we, what's going to make them work. Yeah. And then tables to show us how that how that goes. Pretty cool. If you'd like to explore, God, it's like So you know we were all talking about like how to do keep on the borderlands? There. There's your page 73. How to do another adventure in this adventure. Right? Look through the adventure materials, consider the characteristics of the site. Note any special unique locations, put them in the table, consider denizens and major NPCs, identify the objective of the expedition, play the game as normal, right? Don't try to represent everything. You're using it as inspiration. There's how you make... You got a favorite D&D &D adventure? Mine is against the cult of the reptile god. That's how you do it. Nice, there you go. So the delve mechanics are functionally and narratively similar to undertake a journey and reach your destination. So if you want to use them to tune that focus in, you can. Right? So this is a thing that you can use. So if you're doing journeys, you can use delves rules for that. And then here's how to facilitate delves as a one shot. Cool. Wow, that's so cool. I don't know what that is, but I want to go there. Awesome. Okay, so I guess here's another thing we can do. Go through, uh, go through the uh, your truths checklist, right? So, what this what this functions as is a way to understand how delves material should fit into mechanically and thematically into your existing game. I love that it it releases delve like Sean has released delve knowing that it's a supplement and that there are people coming to it from pre existing games. So if you're looking at this and you're like. 
oh, nobody gets in. There's no war in my game. True of my game, right? Not a lot of war. So strongholds are much simpler, right? Fortified ruins take on a different shape. Does religion influence the world? Hallowed might mean something else in your uh, in your game. Yeah, 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 right? That's quite cool. Yeah, so how to think about these things vis-a-vis -vis your own setting. Right, and then here's the full the full themes that we looked at on the cards. Oh my god, it comes with it comes with right, pre-generated adventures. So these are site starters, 20 sites you can use as inspiration, and then this is where they're keyed on the map. So now Nabake, yeah, that's right, batteries included. So Nabake could theoretically go to any of these. Let's just take a look at the one that's closest to us, right? Down here, number 19, Topple Keep. So Topple Keep is a dangerous infested ruin. Its denizens are blade wings, marsh rats, harrow spiders, the sodden trolls, and carrion newts. It is a wild shadow fen with a skeletal structure, a crumbling tilted ruin that is sunk into the swamp. Cool. No, I like it. So these are all these are all delves you could just grab and, and play on your own. So they they serve to do two things. Can't think of one, grab this and drop it in. Also, they're examples, right? What could it be? What might they look like? Etc. Right? Red Home Sanctum is a corrupted underkeep with a village on top of it. Yeah. Rad. And then we get to denizens. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So denizens, this is how we build our, um, basically our, our encounter table, right? We talked about this at the beginning. And then here's some example denizens that we might find. And these, this is essentially a monster manual, right? These look a lot like modified versions of the monsters from, um, Dungeon World, right? Yeah. Zealots, husks, etc. And we'll dig through this in a second, but so they give us rank, features, what do they want to do? What do they do to get it, right? So that's kind of the, the triad is what is true about them, apropos of nothing? What do they want to get? And then what tactics do they use to implement their features to get their drives? How do the drives influence their features and their tactics, right? Like those three things are tightly connected when envisioning how an NPC works in this game. And then down at the bottom, there's a quest starter, like how you might use this monster to, to play the, play the game, to use this, this monster in your campaign. Cool. So we got husks, we got zealots, we got Atanya. Marrow. I'm basically just looking for art right now. Blade wings, carrion newts, cave lions, shit. Nightmare spiders, shroud crabs. Hot damn. Blight hounds. Yeah, lots and lots of cool creatures and undead for us to fight. I cannot wait for Nabake to get her ass kicked by these creatures. Awesome. Cool. Anomalies. Old. Oh, remember we were talking about zones? Old magic permeates the Iron Lands. These forces sometimes manifest as an anomaly, an otherworldly feature of terrain or environment. Some are the embodiment of ancient spirits and have unknowable motivations. Others are nature given cruel purpose. We've already seen these. The fog cloud is an anomaly, right? So re encountering an, an anomaly, you can take an action, make moves appropriately. Alternately, you can use a scene challenge. This is a recommended approach since it gives the anomaly an appropriate amount of focus or danger. Right. Okay. So you set up a progress track, create a countdown track. And then you make moves. Oh, cool. So this countdown track, I think we're going to we're going to likely see this again later, but this is time progressing on its own 
this is you making progress because in, oh, this is so cool. Okay. So if you've watched the games we've played of Iron Sworn so far, you've noticed that sometimes fights can go on forever, right? Where it's like, I'm fighting. I can't get a strong hit. I hit you. I dodge. I get hurt. You get hurt. We go back and forth, but nothing, nothing ends until either I quit or I, I make a strong hit. The countdown track looks like it fills on its own. And when it's filled, that's it. The fight is over one way or another. Yeah. Interesting. So it's tied to anomalies right now, but when your countdown track is completely filled, you resolve the encounter by making a progress roll. Yeah. It, it just solves that problem. Interesting. So is there, this art is really cool. Is there advice in here about using an, uh, these, this countdown elsewhere? I've de I definitely would want to introduce this somewhere else. Yeah. So when do we check the countdown track? Face danger, secure an advantage. There's this, there's this section in base iron sworn, but this is it being focused on a specific thing. I think, I feel like this should be, the countdown track should just be in there. Yeah. You take an action would fall under another move. Yeah, when do we when do we mark? It looks like maybe it's when you miss. Yeah, mark a countdown box and and pay the price. Yeah, let's look at the flow chart. Set up a progress and a countdown. Envision the danger, then secure an advantage. If you secure an advantage, then we kit, take momentum. Right. So I kind of like that. I kind of feel like you could fairly easily say in a fight, there's an exhaustion meter for you. And if you get, if you, if you miss four times, the fight's over no matter what. I almost want to, I'm going to make a note to think about hacking that in because I think that's worth putting in at least for fights. Because I've noticed that fights tend to drag, right? What was that called? Countdown? I think I knew I need a new Apple pencil. I think mine's breaking. All right. So countdown in fight. So it's like you have four misses. God, you know what it's doing? It's the powered by the apocalypse equivalent of a fourth edition D D skill challenge. Yeah, it's a it's it's a skill challenge. There's a sense of inevitability. It's like how in Apocalypse World, uh, after three, what is it? After three rounds of fighting, it's over. Or when you hit three o'clock, it's over or something. But yeah, yeah, I dig it. That's pretty cool. And then these are some these are some things you might be trying to struggle to get free of, or might have to deal with. Yeah, a glimmer. A gloom. Again, I think this game s s screams for a a um, stalker version. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Threats. The world does not wait for you as you undertake journeys to distant locations. Spend time recovering. Forces that oppose you advance their own agenda. Ah, uh, fronts. Right. Okay, so how does Iron Sworn do the world is moving without you? So, okay, when you swear an Iron Vow, you can optionally associate a threat. The threat is a person, being, faction, or situation responsible for the problem that motivates your vow. Interesting. All right, I'm going to make a note. Threat. So do the thing, but there are people opposing you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you name the threat. Consider its goal. What does it want? If it's in direct opposition to your vow, assign a threat to a formidable or extreme vow. Don't assign more than one threat per vow. Consider limiting threats to shared vows. 
Myrick could have been a threat. Yeah, before I murdered them. Yes. <laughs> right. Non sentient threats can be there too. Um, delving a dungeon. Delving a dungeon before it collapses, right? Going into an unstable environment. The threat is the dungeon is collapsing on you. Yeah. Okay. So tracking the threat. Using the advance a threat move and a menace track. Ooh. Okay. You choose to ignore a situation to deal with more pressing matters. Advance a threat. Fail in a critical moment when opposing a threat. Or time passes. Oh, fun. So this is something that chat could kind of like keep an eye on. Yeah. So chat, chat, you could be like, I think this advance a threat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you do that, you roll percentile dice and see how it moves, right? Burning building could be a delve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So the threat readies its next step. If you're in a position to prevent it, you may attempt to do so. If you succeed, reach a milestone. Otherwise, mark menace. Mark menace is mark progress's arch enemy. Okay. All right. Yeah. Like competitors, that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. So when you advance a threat, you roll and it either marks menace twice, once, or that's right. Yeah. Spend time recovering in Rivendell from a stab from the Morgul blade. Advance Sauron's tracker. Yeah. Cool. All right. Starting at the leftmost box. Mark according to. How many do we mark? It's based on the, the threat level, right? If it's threat level midnight, it's all of them at once. Let me take a let me take a look. OK, so we name the threat. Consider its goal. Making a move. How to mark menace. Mark ticks and fill boxes. Per its rank. Yeah, so in the same way, right? Four, or a three, two, one, two ticks, one tick, right? Depending on how dangerous the threat is. No, but then it would be inverse, wouldn't it? Where do we, I'm looking for the, the assignment of, of the threat. A separate box for menace on the tracker. Yeah, but it's like how many, how many do we, how many do we do? Let me, let me see. Or is it just one? It's just one at a time. Let me see if I have a threat tracker. It might, yeah, it might well just be one or two. Yeah, I don't know. I'll look at the back of the book, but yeah, okay. Based on the maneuver itself. Well, when you mark menace. Oh, it's just, it's just always a box, a box or two boxes. Okay. All right, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause it wouldn't make sense for it to be ticks. Cause a bigger one would take longer. Yeah. There's just 10 boxes and you mark either one of them or two of them. Okay. All right. Um, And then interpreting the threat. If the oracle dice come up as a match, you should introduce a twist. New understanding of the threat. There might be time where you take a hiatus that can advance the threat as well. When you spend an extended time recovering, clear marked condition, set your health to a max value. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, so there's now resting, but resting as moves. And then there's hiatus, which is, I don't care about the threat. Let's let it track. And in exchange, I can clear my conditions, set a value to max, and reset my momentum. Right. So now it differentiates between downtime, which is like waiting for Frodo to recover, and hanging out in a town, but not necessarily resting, which is like being in... um. Uh, the town where they go looking for Gandalf at the very beginning, not Rivendell, but the, the other thing. Yeah. Rivendell is a hiatus, but, um, the Brill, a uh, uh, Bree. Yeah. But Bree is just making some moves trying to find Gandalf. Yeah. 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 
Okay, killer. That makes sense. All right. Uh, and then uh, resolving the threat. When you mark the tenth box, the threat achieves their goal. You have failed. They beat you to it. You can no longer do the thing. If you fulfill your vow and score a strong hit, the threat is toast. If you score a weak hit, the threat sticks around. Ah. And if you score a miss, you failed against the threat. Per the standard outcome, you must resubmit. And the threat is stronger now. They get a new goal and they clear their menace track. Interesting. And then if you forsake your vow, that just means they achieve their goal. Right, okay. That's badass. If you fulfill your vow and score a hit, look at the number of menace boxes. If it's equal to or greater than your vow's progress, take plus one experience. Oh, that's cute. So if you bail out while your threat is strong and succeed, you get one more experience than you normally would. Oh, I like it. If your quest leads to a direct encounter with a threat, how do you avoid prematurely triggering a decisive moment? Circumstances force you into a fight, you defeat it, but you've only killed a couple of progress boxes, you're not ready to fulfill your vow. Keep in mind narrative flexibility. Yeah. Right, because Frodo and Aragorn, they come in contact with the Nazgul a bunch of times throughout Lord of the Rings, but they don't deal with the Nazgul until the very end when the Witch King of Angmar is killed during the Battle of Pelennor Fields? Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. So like recurring threat as part of a larger threat. Yeah. Drums in the Deep is a threat that is a part of the sight delve of Moria that ends in them sacrificing uh, uh, Gandalf to get interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. I dig it. Hey, this is that art. This is the art that somebody posted this on Twitter for me before I got a chance to see this. Look. Look, it's another surly spear maiden. Look. I feel like we know this lady. <laughs> oh, she's cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Objects of power. Objects of power. By default, Ironsworn doesn't really focus on this stuff, um, but we have wealth already, right? We have uh, artifacts and rarities. Now, Nabake has a bag of money, right? Save Sabine has some money. And uh, she, um, yeah, she she uses it, right? Wealth is a fortune hunter thing. We have this. Per the default ability, you get a new asset called wealth, and you can you can spend it, right? Um, people generally barter. Wealth is uh, like coins or or something outside of that bartering. Um, you know, you can you can share your wealth for bonuses. Right. I kind of like I kind of like this. Right. I like having wealth as an abstracted thing that only mercenaries, only fortune hunters really care about. It says something nice about the about the world. Uh, artifacts are a staple of heroic fiction. I think there's a there's an opportunity here for us to make Hulata into an artifact, like going on a quest to awaken Hulata. Right. Artifact quest. I'm gonna make a note. Artifact, quest, right? Awaken the spear, make it better and cooler. So artifacts are objects of power, the focus of a quest, or represent a crucial milestone. They don't use any new or additional mechanics. They have stuff built into them in that regard, right? You can build a story around it. This type of artifact is referred to as a MacGuffin, right? The one that is just like an excuse to do the thing. The Maltese Falcon is the ultimate MacGuffin. Right. But if it's actually important and it matters, then the one ring, that's not a MacGuffin. That's an artifact that's central to the plot. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. 
Okay, so yeah, here are some artifacts. They give you some stuff you can do. So this would be the kind of thing we would do to make up our own, like what does Hulata, Tongue of Lightning, do, right? Roll in the story, what fictional thing can Hulata do after we awaken it? Yeah, neat. And then a rarity, history is often chronicled through objects of power, wars and accords, struggles and triumphs, love and hate, sacrifice and death. These legacies can imbue objects with cultural importance and supernatural gifts. So a rarity is purchased with experience. You won't suddenly find one. Oh yeah, Hulata might be a, might be a rarity instead. Yeah. They augment a specific asset. A skirmisher can use a rarity with bolters their prowess with a spear or wield a special spear that is itself a rarity. Oh, yeah, this makes more sense. Okay, so... Purchasing a rarity with experience. Wielding one. When you make a move aided by an augmented asset, you roll your rarity die in place of your action die. Oh... So in this case, rarities are represented by D10s, like colored D10s. So I would have like a special, I would have a special D10 that represents Hulata, the spear. So I'd be like, I'm going to roll my Hulata die because I'm, oh no, it's the D6. That's right. Yeah. Because it rolls on a result of a D6. So yeah, that would be the die. So you'd have a special one to represent that asset. Yeah. Okay. So these are bonuses that count as aided along with specific examples. And then these are ones where it's not aided, but they let you do something else. Interesting. Okay. And then a bunch of other abilities. Oh. That's so cool. I can't wait to try it out. Evolving the story of a rarity and like losing a rarity. Yeah, so I think Iron Weapons... Named, like, Elf Sticker and Hulata, those are both rarities. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, so now we can awaken our, our spear, and we can start learning... What god worship, like what god the iron was made from, right? Yeah, cool. So, like, um, Excalibur is an artifact, but a magic sword might be a rarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also like Horn of the Mammoth. Yeah, a rarity is an upgrade to an asset. Whereas an artifact is its own standalone thing. Yeah. Cool. Lots of options for us. So what do we have right now? Just as a, let's go shopping real quick. So, uh, animal kin, dancer, fortune hunter. We could get a coin of favor. Right. That's a, that's a thing we could look at, um, that would fit. Let's see what else. Pretender, the tattoo of many faces. These are neat. Uh, let's see, I'm looking for the spear one. Dragon's bite. Cool. Cold iron spear. Yeah, so they just they just improve your existing stuff gives it some more like heft nice cool all right uh and then we have let's see several new oracles so we've got aspect and focus oracles all right we have our sight oracles Got some character ones, some advancements on the character oracles. Ah, oh, these are so good. Monster oracles.
traps, combat events. Oh man, you could use these for like a uh, background. You could use these for background war. So like if a war is going on, you could track the the rounds of I could definitely see how to do mass combat with a system like this too. Yeah. Some new threats. Beautiful landscape. And then we've got our appendix of all of the moves. And that's it. God damn. Oh, I'm so excited. Like, I... Hearing bits and pieces about Delve on the internet from you, fans, folks who are coming into chat and talking about it, I knew that it would be cool. But, like, I think, I think the real value in Delve... And Iron Sworn in general is that, yes, it's a good game qua a game, right? It's good just for itself. But if you care at all about looking at the lineage of Apocalypse World and the Powered by the Apocalypse engine, and you've played a bunch of those games, Sean has a grasp on what Powered by the Apocalypse could do. Uh, and and for that, I am I am like just deeply, deeply impressed. Uh, I am I am going to go and order everything in physical right now so that I can run it for groups at this at this little game getaway that I'm doing at the end of the month because this stuff is really cool and I like the I I've never played a solo RPG that I've enjoyed this much and I look forward to it. I missed not playing last week so so much. I can't wait. So if you want to see these rules in action, uh Come by this weekend or keep an eye on YouTube uh, Sunday morning uh, at um, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, if you use the link uh, ironsworn uh, bit.ly slash ironsworn FL, uh, I can track that you went and checked out the game uh, from here. Uh, or if you know you're going to buy the PDF from drive through, there's an affiliate link down below uh, on my uh, on my channel. But however you get it, go in and check out ironsworn. Grab the free version of the game, read it, watch the first 10 episodes that I have, watch my first look, try it out yourself, either solo or with a group, and and yeah, please come back on Sunday and you can watch my garbage fire half-elf try to impress her merchant girlfriend who does not yet know that Nabake is in love with her. She's a total fucking mess. I think you're really going to like it if you haven't watched it already, uh, and you can check out all of the back episodes on YouTube uh, whenever you like. So that's it. That is our that is our first look at Delve, which is an Iron Sworn supplement for delving into uh, strange sites and uh, and exploring uh, more in depth the kinds of weird environments you might get up to in your game. Uh, if you're not already a part of it, and I'm sorry I don't have a link handy, but you're not already on the Iron Sworn uh, server, the Discord server, go check it out. I understand that there is some playtesting maybe going on vis-a-vis -vis Starforge, which you fucking know I'm excited about. So if you thought I was hype about Dark Fantasy, just wait until we get our, our hands on a first look for that. Uh, thank you, Sean, for sponsoring this first look. Thank you, my beloved audience, for coming and watching. Uh, we will see you next time, whether it is for a new first look or for some other stream. We'll see you there. Bye, everybody.